So good morning, everybody. Uh, in today's lesson, we're going to be learning about uh, Kingdom Animalia. It's the last of the kingdoms that we have to cover. Um, and to me, it's the most fascinating and the one I think is most relatable. So let's begin our lesson today by thinking about what the characteristics of animals are. So in other words, what would allow a taxonomist to classify an organism uh, as belonging to Kingdom Animalia as opposed to uh, being included in one of the other kingdoms, right? So in other words, what would exclude it from the other kingdoms? What would make it special enough to be included in its own kingdom? So pause the video and think about what those characteristics might be. Okay, well, I'm hoping that in your list, um, you included the fact that all animals by definition have to be multicellular. Uh, right? So think about that. Kingdom Animalia typically includes organisms that are a little bit more complex. And co so the more complex you are, the more likely you are to be multicellular and to require specialized cells. Okay. Hopefully you included eukaryotic. Um, so animals, again, being more complex, more evolved, um, are, are likely to have cells that have a membrane-bound nucleus and some specialized organelles. Okay. Heterotrophic, yes, all organisms belonging to kingdom Animalia um, are not able to f uh, create their own food. They must consume other organisms in order to sustain, um, sustain all and gain energy. Or all organisms in kingdom Animalia lack cell walls. We only have a cell membrane. You may remember in grade, I want to say 10, when we looked at different uh, types of cells, plant and animal cells under the microscope, um, the plant cells very clearly had a cell wall, but the animal cells did not. So no cell walls in any animal cell. Okay, mobile. So in at some stage in life, uh, organisms belonging to kingdom Animalia must have been mobile. So you may be thinking, okay, well, you know, corals, for instance, don't move. Well, at some stage in their life, they must have been able to move, which is why we're able to classify them um, in Kingdom Animalia. And last but not least, most organisms in Kingdom Animalia reproduce sexually, which is to say that there has to be some sort of joining of male and female gametes or sex cells. Uh, those sex cells have to fuse in order pr to uh, produce offspring. Now, uh, the exception to this, we would say, would be something like an organism that loses a limb and is able to regrow that limb. Um, some starfish, depending on how they are transected, will be able to regrow one of their limbs as an example. So as we know, there are a multitude of ways to classify organisms. And so in today's lesson, I hope to kind of break down some of the ways, some of the characteristics that we use to classify uh, those organisms belonging to kingdom Animalia. Uh, so one of them is uh, the number of body layers. So um, let me show you a little picture here. Um, so this is an example of an organism that is just beginning to grow. And so you'll, what you'll notice here are three different body layers. We have the ectoderm, and the ectoderm, ecto means sort of outer, so ectoderm, derm meaning layer, uh, you know, we, and we have the endoderm, endo mean, meaning inner or inside. And then meso meaning middle, mesoderm. So we have, uh, so all animals are going to have two or three germ layers, and those germ layers eventually evolve to become or grow into, I should say, uh, specific tissues in in the adult organism. Okay, so uh, we are going to classify organisms based on how many germ layers they have, either two or three. So they may be missing that mesoderm. But all, all organisms in Kingdom Animalia are going to have an ectoderm and an endoderm. So moving on to talk about the details of this. Uh, so the ectoderm um, is the outer layer. So if you think about, well, what is our outer layer? Our, our outer layer is comprised of our skin, 
right? So that should come to mind first, right? So uh, along with that is their nervous system. The endoderm is the inner layer. So think about like the lining of your gut, like your stomach, for instance, or your intestines, right? That would make up your endoderm. And the mesoderm, and remember, not all organisms have the mesoderm, uh, is the middle layer. So various organ systems, um, think about just like that space in between or a body cavity, right? So there we have it, ways of, um, of describing um, or characterizing the members of kingdom animalia are based on the number of body layers. Another way to classify members of kingdom animalia is based on whether or not they have a body cavity. And the special word we use for body cavity is a colum. Okay, so we would say that something that has a body cavity or a colum is referred to as a colomate, whereas any organism that does not have a body cavity is called an acolomate. Okay, so um, well, what do we mean by that? Well, let's look at the diagrams. I'm going to start first with the diagram of, a, of the colomate, which is in this case, this looks like an earthworm. Okay, and so you'll see here, it will say here's the body covering, your ectoderm, we have the digestive tract here, which is your endoderm, right? The inner layer. And then we have the tissue layer lining the column and spending and suspending the organs, right? Which is our mesoderm, right? Our middle layer here, right? But the column is that body cavity that's in between, right? So sort of, you can just think of it like empty space, in other words. The acolomate, for example, and our classic example would be the flatworm right here. Flatworms are a lot less complex than earthworms. But the flatworm will have an ectoderm, an outer layer, its body covering. It will have a di digestive tract, which is its endoderm. And it has a mesoderm as well, that middle layer. But what it doesn't have is a body cavity, right? It doesn't have a colum, which is that sort of void space in between the mesoderm and the endoderm. So what is a colum again? Well, the colum is that fluid-filled space that's in between the body wall, okay, the mesoderm, and the uh, gut or the endoderm, okay? And what is its purpose? Well, we tend to see a colum present in organisms that are a little bit more complex. And what its role is, is to contain and protect any organs or organ systems that are there. Okay, so as we said, the less complex invertebrates, right, like our, um, our flatworm, are not going to have a colum, and they're referred to as acolomates. So the next characteristic that allows us to classify animals is their symmetry elements. So there are two types of symmetry that we're going to discuss. Um, the first is what we call radial symmetry. So I think it probably makes sense for me to talk about this diagram first. You, you know, well, when you think of the word radial, maybe the, word, the, the term radius comes to mind, and it's sort of like the radius of a circle. So if I were to have, um, let me see if I can get a circle going here. No, not so much. Okay, well, let me draw one. Um, so, you know, if I have a circle, the radius is the distance from the center out. So we can almost think of radial symmetry as being sort of like symmetry from, like from the top, if you're looking at a top view, whether it can be divided into equal pieces. Sort of like an orange, I guess you can say. Right, so organisms such as... Um, you know, hydra, the jellyfish, starfish, all have um, what we call radial symmetry. Okay, so you can think about a starfish as be having equal sort of symmetrical pieces. And that results in what we call slow locomotion. Locomotion meaning movement. So organisms with radial symmetry typically will have slower movement. And so here are your typical examples of that. Okay, so radial symmetry means symmetry about some sort of center point um, moving outward. 
And so the next type of symmetry that we want to talk about is bilateral. So bi is a prefix we know means two. So bilateral symmetry basically describes how we could split the organism down its center and create two equal halves. Okay, so what that does is it can designate a true head region as a result of that. So, um, you know, we would say that humans have a bilateral symmetry. If we were to think about, um, let me think, I'm just going to, I'm going to do a really nasty, poor job of drawing here. But, you know, if I had a, my head, here's, you know, my legs and my arms, we could describe our bilateral symmetry like right sort of down the middle there. Right, so there are some terms along that um, that uh, if we had done our um, pig dissection, we would have brought up again. But um, you might remember from our frog dissection last year um, that you know there's the anterior, which is the um, front, the posterior, which is the back, the dorsal, which is the sort of back side. Uh, so posterior means like back end but dorsal means sort of back side and then ventral which is the stomach region okay so organisms that have bilateral symmetry are are typically more quicker moving um so we can think of our you know a fish worms for sure insects and so on and so forth so a fourth way that we classify an animals is uh whether they have what we call segmentation. So um, you may remember in our worm dissection in grade 10, where one of the activities that we had you to do was we had you count the segments that were present in that earthworm, and that helped you to locate certain, um, certain organ systems within the worm, for example, right? Um, and so that is one way that we classify animals, is based on whether they have different segments. Um, so for example, if we were talking about insects, we could talk about whether or not how many body segments they had. Um, and normally we would go through and do um, a lab on arthropods describing the different type number of body segments that they can uh, contain, like their abdomen, their thorax, and so on and so forth. Okay, so um, so um, dividing the body into, the ability to divide the body into repetitive sections or segments is one way to classify animals. Um, so th the thing that we need to know is that the other segments will work if one segment is damaged. So we can think of, of us as having various limbs. If one of our limbs is damaged, then um, typically if that is dealt with, the rest of the segments will work just fine. Okay, the segments can help with locomotion. We think about our legs as helping us to move in the worms. Those segments will help to, uh, to contract all motion for the, that worm to, to move around. So the last and final characteristic that I want to discuss today is movement. So, and that was mentioned in the introduction, uh, you know, animals, all animals need to be motile or mobile in the first, at some sort of stage in their lives, right? So, as, organ as living organisms evolved, uh, so did our nerve and muscle tissue, and that allowed for, um, for, for organisms, certain classes of organisms to become mobile, including animals, okay? So sometimes we have organisms such as sponges that I mentioned earlier that are mo mobile in their early stages or juvenile stages, uh, but that they become um, immobile or the fancy sciencey word for that is sessile. They become sessile in their adult stage, right? So sponges are a good example of that. I think I mentioned corals perhaps. Um, yeah, so there we have it. So there are five ways to classify members of Kingdom Animalia. Now, depending on how animals, animals are classified in these other groups, they, this may or may not allow us to further classify them. 
uh, as belonging to one of two bigger sort of groups, and those are the invertebrates and the vertebrates. So those are likely terms that you've heard before. Take a guess. What do you think invertebrate refers to? Let's see if you are right. So an invertebrate are invertebrates are organisms that do not have a backbone. So we mean a we don't mean a spinal column. We mean a backbone specifically. Okay. So what are some examples of this? Well, sponges, gel, and most people, uh, you know, have a hard time thinking about a sponge as an animal, but indeed it is. We're going to learn more about them. Jellyfish, hydra, you may or may not know what a hydra is, but that's okay, that's coming soon. Worms, snails, squids, starfish, and insects. So what do these have in common? They do not have a backbone. Well, you may be saying, well, some insects are kind of hard and have, you know, a, a tough exterior. Well, yes. They have an exoskeleton, which is different than having an endoskeleton. Okay, moving on. Um, so, surprise, what is probably surprising to you, maybe not, is that over 95% of all of the animals known on Earth happen to be invertebrates, and that we have over 30 phyla, that's the plural for phylum, for phylum, is 95% of all animal species are invertebrates, um, which is crazy to think about. Okay. Which means that only 5% of organisms are fall into the other category, which are the vertebrates. So vertebrates are organisms that, of course, have, in fact, a backbone, and that begins as this flexible rod-shaped structure, which is referred to as a nautocord, nautocord, that eventually evolves into the backbone, okay? So, not to say that um, invertebrates don't necessarily have some sort of nerve um, column, a spinal column per se, it's a structure that's like that, but it will never be encased, in the case of an invertebrate, it's never gonna be encased in a backbone, okay? So, the vertebrates, we're also gonna learn a little bit more about Okay, in the, in the following lessons, we're going to be learning about the different types of invertebrates, but we're also going to be learning about the different types of vertebrates. So uh, take a minute, pause the video, and I want you to think about, well, what are the vertebrates that I know of? How might, when I think about all of the vertebrates on Earth, how might I separate them into groups? All right, well, let's see how you did. I'm just going to move this up a bit. There we go. Okay, so they are divided into five main classes. Let's see how many of this list that you were able to come up with on your own. Fish. The amphibians, right? Like frogs, for instance. Reptiles. Birds. And finally, mammals. I'm guess guessing you got mammals but I'm not sure about the other ones. So um, maybe you just weren't sure where to start. At any rate, here they are. And as we, um, as we learn about vertebrates, we're gonna see, well, what are the features that distinguish uh, those organisms that are classified as fish versus amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals? And some of the characteristics are obvious, and others may not be so obvious. So stay tuned. So as we mentioned before, an overwhelming majority of, or, of organisms belonging in kingdom animalia are invertebrates. Less than about 5% of them are, um, are going to be in the vertebrate. Depends how, you know, in terms of significant digits, how we round that off. Um, but there's only one phylum. All vertebrates belong to phylum chordata. Right, you can see the word cord in there, which kind of gives you some hints about that. All right, so that's it for today's lesson. Look on Google Classroom for some associated questions so that you can help to uh, solidify your understanding of today's concepts and, and just uh, make sure that you're on the right track with them.